My name is Professor Matt Dunn and I'm the Professor of Paediatric Haematology and Oncology Research at the University of Newcastle and Hunter Medical Research Institute. Uh, I received my PhD uh, in 2012 uh, and have been focused on paediatric cancer research since then. Um, I've travelled around the world working in the laboratories of experts in uh, Denmark, Belgium and the Netherlands uh, and Switzerland. And I established my group here uh, at the University of Newcastle in 2014 when I received a uh, Cancer Institute of New South Wales Early Career Research Fellowship. And I've been privileged to be continually supported by fellowship funding ever since uh, and now uh, lead the Cancer Signaling Research Group here at the University of Newcastle and Hunter Medical Research Institute in the School of Biomedical Sciences and Pharmacy. So diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, DIPG or DMG, is a paediatric adolescent and young adult brain tumour diagnosed along the midline structures of the brain or the central nervous system. Every day in the United States of America, a child or young person is diagnosed with DMG and every two weeks in Australia, uh, a child is diagnosed with DIPG. And together they're given 12 months to live with less than 10% of patients living two years and 1% of patients living five years, making it the most deadly of all forms of cancers, adult or children. The only recognised treatment is palliative radiotherapy and it's delivered over a six week period, five days a week. And for the young patients with DIPG, under a general anaesthetic every day. Tragically, radiation will only provide a three month survival benefit and the tumour will then commence growing again. And one by one, switch off bodily functions coordination, movement, swallowing, speaking, autonomic defecation and urination, breathing and heartbeat. So my team is focused on DIPG research and this is thanks to the courageous and selfless donation of families who have tragically been affected by the disease and left their child's tumour to our work. We use sophisticated technologies called proteogenomic technologies to try and unlock treatment targets for this devastating disease. Uh, so we look at the patient's genetics and then we try and tie in what the um, building blocks of the cell are, which are known as proteins. What are the corresponding proteins that are associated with each patient's genetics? Because the fact is that more than 90% of drugs that we use to treat disease, uh, cancers and other, don't target genes, they target proteins. Uh, and in this disease, um, we have very little information about what proteins are present and what communication pathways are used by these tumours to drive such a devastating and universally fatal uh, diagnosis. So our tumour our research is focused on proteogenomic research to identify treatments and combinations of treatments for these diseases. In 2018, we hypothesised that the PR3 kinase AKT signalling pathway, which is the target of Paxalicib, uh, was the dominant pathway involved in the growth and proliferation and, and metabolism of diffuse midline glioma cells. Then in collaboration with Dr. Jason Kane and Dr. Ron Feierstein from Monash University, uh, we then confirmed that the target of Paxalicib, PIK3CA, was indeed critical for uh, DMG cells to grow. Um, we did this by using sophisticated gene deletion strategies where we cut out the PIK3CA gene across 38 different DMG cell lines that had been donated by families from around the world. And indeed, when you cut that gene out, cells no longer grow. So it really highlights the importance of the PIK3CA pathway in the way that DMG cells grow and the importance of Paxalicib, which is a brain penetrant PIK3CA targeting drug. Now, we've been using Paxalicib now for almost six years in DMG, uh, and we've done a lot of work with it. We've done a lot of dose optimization. We've done a lot of um, proliferation and cytotoxicity assays, a lot of uh, in, vit in vivo models where we put DMGs into the brainstem of mice and then treat the mice with the drug. And we show a consistent survival benefit. But these survival benefits are transient because these tumours are complex and there's only so much drug we can get into the brainstem. So we also now know 
how these cells respond to paxalicib exposure, and we've identified several new pathways that can be targeted in combination with paxalicib for a greater benefit. Um, if I focus on DMG, um, well, DMGs are highly genetically heterogeneous, meaning that these tumours have at least five different mutations in them um, that cause them to transform from a happy brainstem um, uh, cell into a malignant aggressive tumour. And that really highlights the complexities of treating this disease. I mean, targeting five different mutations in the one cell is impossible. Um, and so, um, we've discovered that these tumours are really energy hungry. They need a lot of energy to make them grow as rapidly and as aggressively as they do. Uh, and so of course we can't target these five mutations, we've really focused on uh, targeting metabolism. And of course the PIK3CA pathway or the PR3 kinase AKT signaling pathway, which is the target of Paxalicib, is one of the dominant pathways which is required for energy production within these tumour cells. In fact, if you cut out PIK3CA in the developing brainstem, the brain shows shrinkage. So meaning that you know, this pathway is critical for normal development. And if this pathway is hyperactivated, you can understand that these brains would be expanded. And that's exactly what happens in, in uh, these DMG tumors that have mutations and activation of this pathway. The tumors get massive. So if we can target that pathway, um, then we can dampen down some of the met metabol metabolomic pathway or the way that these cells produce energy, um, and that way they slow their growth. But of course, getting enough drug to the brainstem to be completely cytotoxic or to kill the tumours is really challenging, and we haven't been able to achieve that. But what we've been able to discover is that when we get enough paxalicid to the brainstem, we dampen their growth, switch off some of their metabolism, but in, in doing so, switch on another pathway that the tumour tries to use to continue to produce energy. And when we come along and target that pathway in combination, we can extend the survival of our murine DIPG models or our mouse models of DIPG by 156% compared to, to standard peer radiation. So we're now working on trying to get this combination of therapies, which is Paxalicib used in combination with Enzostorin and radiation, standard of care, into a clinical trial um, to be open in Australia, hopefully sometime next year or the year after. Well, at the moment we have one open international clinical trial using Paxalicib in combination with OMP201 in the PNOC022 trial, which is open in 31 hospitals around the world and currently has 137 patients enrolled. Um, we've just done the first analysis um, of patients that were diagnosed um, with DIPG and, and received standard of care radiation before enrolling in the trial and then receiving the combination of Paxalicib and OMP201 between four and 14 weeks post-radiation. Now, patients diagnosed on ARM1 received either Paxalicib or onc one with radiation. And I think that's an important um, uh, observation to make is that we've done a lot of work with Paxalicib showing that it amplifies the response to radiation therapy. Um, and so we're hoping that that first arm um, will show an even longer survival benefit um, uh, in the next analysis, which will happen sometime towards the second half of next year. Um, and at the same time, because we work so much on Paxalicin, we know how it affects um, a living organism uh, systemically or, or globally. We know that uh, inhibit inhibition of the PR3 kinase pathway modulates glucose homeostasis. And what I mean by that, it disrupts how sugars are distributed throughout the body. Uh, and the body tries to um, uh, secrete extra glucose when um, the PI3 kinase pathway is inhibited by Paxalicin systemically. And that's uh, a negative in terms of the drug, but can be quite easily combated using uh, diabetic drugs or anti-glycemics such as metformin. And we've shown that Paxalicin in combination with metformin has an even stronger benefit uh, for these DMG patients and cell line models. So in the next uh, iteration of the PNOC022 trial, we will be including metformin um, used at um, low dose um, just to control glucose homeostasis in patients receiving Paxalicib. And we hope that will increase um, the efficacy of the combination of the drugs, but also decrease things like, you know, high like 
glucose levels or insulin levels uh, and, and decrease any potential side effects that are related to too much glucose in the system. So that's an exciting um, uh, new uh, uh, clinical um, research that we are looking forward to, to analysing over the next 12 to 18 months. And at the same time, uh, we're writing a completely new clinical trial, um, which, will which will use paxalacib in combination with the PKC inhibitor Enzostorin um, with radiation therapy uh, and again using metformin as supportive care for patients receiving paxalacib. We've um, got that data currently um, under final review um, in a very great journal, which we hope to release to you soon. Um, and it's a really exciting study. Uh, and it's, you know, the clinical benefit that we hope that we'll get from it is quite remarkable. And, and at the moment, we have both um, pharmaceutical companies on board willing to support the studies. And because it's a number of drugs, we are going to do it um, in a safety environment, so a phase one safety trial, just to make sure that we get the doses of both drugs in combination with radiation and metformin right before we extend these studies, should they show safety and tolerability uh, into our PNOC platform and then can be released globally uh, ac across all the PNOC sites. So it's an exciting period. Um, there's a lot of work to do, um, but we are moving in the right direction to, to try and get patients some recognised therapies when they're diagnosed rather than just palliative radiotherapy. There's a couple of ways. Um, one, they can contact the University Office of um, Philanthropy and contact and ask to support uh, Dunlab's research. Uh, and the other way is that they can um, contact um, uh, our charity called Run DIPG, uh, and that's rundipg.org, um, and uh, find a way to support our charity. And, and our charity is designed um, to help those um, who need it the most. Um, where our, go our motto is moving towards a cure because one of the first things that patients lose when they're diagnosed with DIPG is their ability to move. And so we're all trying to move as much as we can for those that can't. Um, and so a good way to, to fundraise is to hold an event or to run a marathon or to walk a bushwalk uh, and try and raise funds as you do it. And also it's important to raise awareness of this universally fatal malignancy that affects 20 to 25 Australian children each year and 360 American. Before um, 2018, uh, there was very little known about DIPG and, and my team and I and, and colleagues around the world have worked incredibly hard to highlight the importance of DIPG research, both in our community, but also to our government. Uh, and I hope that that message is getting through, um, but we need your support. We need your support to keep this lab running. It's an expensive endeavour. Um, we have a lot of things on the go and we're making positive inroads towards treatments for these children, but we need your support. So either contact Run DIPG or the University of Newcastle um, Office of Philanthropy and, and pledge your support to our research. I think the evidence that we've established, um, both in my group and groups around the world over the last five years, has really started to show that there's a chance of long-term survival. I think that we need to combine multiple modalities to treat this disease, which includes radiation, uh, includes um, pharmaceuticals such as paxalacib and other therapies that get into the brain, and it also includes immune therapies. And whether we give these therapies together or systematically or systemically, I don't really know yet. Um, but those are the studies that we're doing in our group where we identify um, treatment targets like the PR3 kinase signaling pathway. We identify how these cells respond to that drug. And then we also look at what the immune properties are of these tumors. So I'm thinking that in the next five to 10 years, we'll have a treatment paradigm um, that, that isn't just radiation. Uh, and that's a, a number of therapies and a number of different modalities that lead to patients living longer than five years and, and hopefully even further. Mm -hmm.